So for anybody watching this recording, welcome. This is the monthly coaching session on self-organizing systems on Tuesday, 14th of April, 2020. It's me, Nick Osborne here with, do you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Yeah, hi, I'm Delan Fernando from Animal Think Tank. And we're here to have some coaching, answer some of your questions, Dylan, and talk about anything you want to around self-organization, self-management, self-organizing systems. Great. Um, so I guess just, uh, I might just give you a bit more information about myself. Uh, I don't know how much Leila's been into it with you. So um, I spent three months with Animal Rebellion where we kind of worked a little bit um, through in a few elements of, of sort of self-organizing, um, mostly through sort of autonomy of, um, of, of circles and roles. Um, but in a fairly chaotic environment where there weren't really, there wasn't a whole lot of clarity on, on the rules that were in play. Um, and now I've joined Animal Think Tank uh, and essentially it's really early stages for the organization. Um, and uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm essentially kind of working a lot on the organization, uh, trying to figure out um, basically the governance system of the organization, how can we work better together? Um, and at the moment, sort of where we're at is uh, we're looking at bringing in sociocracy. Um, so we've engaged uh, a consultant um, to sort of start gradually um, introducing sociocracy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much that I kind of want to want to go into but also it's one of those things where I don't really know where to start because um, there's just so much, like so many little things. And I always want to just kind of get in there and start doing it, uh, which I'm really keen on doing. But um, like, I guess the thing that, that is really floating to the top of my mind right now is, so I suppose we have this environment where people like, th there's maybe a bit of tension around clarity about where is the power sitting, um, who has the authority to make decisions. Um, but at the same time, there's perhaps a little bit of like, oh, kind of, uh, you know, people think of words like governance and things like, you know, the soft stuff, I suppose, of working together and think, ah, oh, you know, this is crap. Um, why do we need to focus on this? And I suppose I, I'm like, I see the need for it, but uh, like, I mean, I think everybody kind of, feels a need for more fluent ways of working. But my question is, how do we kind of get people, um, how do we help people to buy into this idea of, of creating together rules of how decisions are made and work is distributed? Yeah, that's a great place to start. And I would suggest that you've, in what you said, were the seeds of one way to go about doing that. Mm. Um, so let me start by saying one really not very productive way to go about doing that is to like come in and say, right, we're going to self-organize in this way and there's this system or there's these tools and we're going to start using these because it can very easily feel like a kind of imposition there yeah. of like, hey, I thought this was supposed to be around autonomy and distributed power, but we're having this way of working imposed on us. And for a lot of people that doesn't sit very well. Mm -hmm. so an alternative way is to do kind of what you were saying which is there are these tensions arising around some of these issues you know where decision making power lies and how decision gets made and how that's documented all those kinds of things so i would suggest using those tensions as a way to introduce some of the bits of the structure that are needed to resolve them mm -hmm. so if you're sensing or anybody else is sensing or starting to voice some of those issues then one way of approaching it is to like just create a space for a pause and say okay guys let's you know let's take a pause from trying to get the work done for a moment yeah. and then bring in this idea of working on the organization rather than working in the organization which i heard you mention and let's take a step back and look do a little bit of work on the organization and then explicitly 
surface or name the issue that you see being uh, the intention around and then explore like invite other perspectives other people to voice what's going on for them around that and bring some of that to the surface and then you can suggest introducing well here's one thing that we could put in place to help clarify or to help evolve or to help move this issue on a bit mm. and then introduce it and maybe start to experiment with it and do the action learning cycle have, having experimented with it to then reflect and see how did it go after a while mm -hmm. and that way you're building in pieces and bringing them in as needed a little bit like a kind of lego thing so like you identify a problem and here's a way of resolving it and you bring that piece in now you can bring another piece in um, i know that's quite vague then it's a bit abstracted but it's a, a process that you can use that is it feels very different and it has a very different result to imposing something from the top like saying right everybody now we're going to do this how does that sound yeah that seems really fair um yeah and i think that's sort of what we are what, what we're slowly sort of going to do over time mm. um so the consultant that we've got he's going to basically be joining in um on our meetings and kind of do an hour before um, talk a bit about some concepts and think about something we, we might want to bring in. Then he'll sit through the meeting with us mm. uh, and we'll kind of try to practice with whatever concept we introduce yeah. um, throughout the meeting and then do sort of a debrief after. So mm. we're going to do that for a few meetings and see how we go. Um, so and I know this probably would, would vary based on sort of, you know, what are the needs of the group um, and et cetera. Um, in terms of which concepts you bring in first, but in your experience, are there certain concepts that work um, that are sort of easier to, or, or I guess certain concepts that are, that provide a good gateway into sort of working on these new, so we're, we're, we're really looking at going towards these more agile paradigms um, that you talk about. Um, so you know, really putting in sociocracy with a strong element of feedback, uh, of like utilizing feedback and um, being really clear on, on who does what, creating roles as they, as they need to come up. Um, so in terms of getting there, are there, are there particular processes or particular, particular concepts that might be more useful to introduce earlier on mm. than others? Mm. That all depends on the stage that the group has reached in its own development um, because depending yeah you know groups go through a kind of life cycle of certain kind of stages and depending on where a group is will inform what's needed i don't yeah. know if you've seen i wrote a series of of articles around psychological safety and self-organization I don't know if you've seen those. I haven't got around to reading them, no. Okay. Not yet. So um, what that series of articles does is it identifies seven different stages that um, a group or organisation will go on in the journey towards more mature self-organising practice. Mm -hmm. And at each stage, there's a particular issue that surfaces. So it might be something like, we don't know who is making decisions around here. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, that uh, creates a particular obstacle towards things being effective and clear and working well. And then there's a particular thing you can bring in to resolve that. And it might be that um, there's no not enough safety to talk about some of the hidden um, shadow power dynamics that are happening. And then there's something else you can bring in. Um, it might be that there's you know a set of practices you can bring in to to support that so um my answer i can't give that answer too generically yeah um, other than refer you to that i mean maybe i can just quickly show you that table have you seen that table there's a no. kind of matrix i'll just quickly show you yeah that sounds great this matrix here so let me just share my screen with you Okay, so if this is um, 
the homepage of the website, the Evolving Organization website, it's on the blog here. And there's a short summary version of this article, which is here, and then it goes into much longer, like there's one longer article for each of these seven different stages. Yeah. The but screen this, share is not coming up at the moment. Oh, it's not coming up. So. Yeah. yeah, it's just showing like a URL. Okay. Um, let me do that again then. Are you seeing there that? There we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these are those seven different stages. They're on from the, the blog post. And it says, um, like identified what's happening at this stage and then the obstacles so it's psychological safety and trust and working effectively together and then what's needed yeah. for deeper psychological safety. So these are kind of seven distinct stages. Right. And then ways to address those at each one. Mm. Um, I don't know if, if any one of those speaks more to what the situation you're in right now than any of the others. Yeah, I think it's uh, probably around stage one, stage two still. Mm. Yeah. So if you're in a stage where um, there's no formal hierarchy, or there's nothing su suitable to replace it, which means there's no clear organizational structure or documented processes for making decisions or how authority works. Because mm -hmm. um, you know that's what some of the replacements for hierarchy do. Yeah. And what often happens is people will be informally in charge, but without accountability. So there'll be this kind of informal power structure where we say, we don't want to work in a hierarchy. And we know that, yeah. so we're not going to do that. But, yeah. If you don't put something else in place to replace the power structure of the, the formal hierarchy, then you get this informal structure, which is emergent. Yeah. And it involves then you have people have, who have social power and then there's rank and privilege and all kinds of things that naturally emerges if there's nothing else to put in place. Um, yeah. So then what's needed around that? With the deep psychological safety and just the organization working well is creating clarity around who does what and how to work. Yeah. And okay. so that is a kind of fundamental starting point. Um, do you want to talk about that? What needs, what could happen around that anymore or where do you want to go with that now? Um, yeah, uh, I guess I'll just sort of, um, tell you a bit about what uh, what kind of our next step on that is and then you can maybe say if, let me know if you think we're on the right track mm -hmm. so um at the moment we sort of have um someone in the organization who, who was basically the founder um and then i suppose there was like some confusion over okay is this a collective or um is it not um i think most people were like fairly clear that it wasn't quite a collective but then also that role. Um, so this founder has ba has basically a lot of like. I think the thing that maybe wasn't as clear to everybody, um, but now is becoming increasingly clear, is that he kind of has a really strong vision for the organisation, and um, it happens that all of our like all of our visions more or less align with his vision, and so that so the direction of the organisation is largely kind of being uh, charted by this one particular person. And so my kind of next step in is to bring this up in our next uh, kind of general core meeting um, and kind of formalize this role so that there is some kind of accountability to it. Um, and so I'm planning on kind of drafting up a bit of a role description based on, I suppose, um, what's provided in sociopathy and holacracy. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of using that to guide the discussion that happens in the meeting. Um, do you think that seems like a reasonable next step? Is there any other considerations that I should be uh, looking at before going into it? Yeah, yeah, so we can go into that in a bit more depth. Um, just before we do that, there's a bit of background noise, or it seems to have paused now, but there was a bit of background noise there. Oh, right. um, 
is there a door you can close or something? Is there someone doing something in another room or? Yeah, one moment. Yeah. How's that? Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's better. Um, so that sounds like a good step forward. And what I, well, there's lots to say about that, but one of the things is a lot of people um, feel a bit constrained or a bit um, re resistant to taking that step because they don't feel safe enough to do it. And like doing it would be something of a challenge to a current power holder and they would feel like that their position in the organization is somewhat at risk so but it sounds like from what you're saying that that's not the case that you feel kind of safe and secure enough in your position there and in the relationships to be able to bring in something of like this questioning around the existing power structure is that right yeah i think it's more it's more uh, i don't think there's a problem with the existing power structure i think it's more a, a question of um, affirming it mm. um, and also setting bounds on what this one role is able to do and yeah. what this one role should be expected to do because at the moment as well there's a bit of a there's a bit of a burden of um, that this person has too much responsibility I would say and and um, sometimes if it, maybe you might get situations where someone doesn't want to do something and they might just sort of palm it off to to him mm. um, by default, which is sort of, you know, it's not within his purview to take on everything. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, that sounds good. Um, sometimes, I know, from what you're saying, you know, it makes sense. I know because of various positions I've been in organisations, when someone's on the receiving end of that, Sometimes it can be completely fine and like, oh, thank God, you know, let's talk about this and let's distribute some of this because it's too much on me and I want to get it off my shoulders. Mm. You know, that can be one response. But another response can be something of a kind of like threat around, um, especially for founders, feeling like, you know, their baby is being taken away from them or, you mm. know, some of their authority that they've earned by founding it is being questioned. So yeah, just to be aware that there might be some of that going on from the other side but assuming sure. that um, things are okay enough I would suggest that yeah the idea of um, starting to document and write down um, delineate like this role and what the what you use the word responsibilities are for it mm -hmm. another word that's often used in this context is accountabilities yeah are, and we can dig more into that yeah um, that would be a good place to start along with i would suggest starting to do that for other roles as well mm. and it yeah. being something that um is done as a way to try and just just document say let's just try and like capture and name and document what's currently happening yeah what's the work that's currently being done and what's the ongoing tasks around that some you know ongoing work for an organization uh, can often be called an accountability or a responsibility or a mandate. Yeah, just documenting that. So not trying to say how things should be or how we'd like them to be, but just like, just like let's paint a picture of the current reality. Mm. And I guess your consultant might be doing some of that with you. Yeah, yeah, I would assume so. Great. And doing it in that way can then provide a bit of a balance to taking the focus just off of. Um, the founder around mm. their power and their role and saying, well, let's look at this in relation to the power of the other people and roles and work that's happening in the organization. And let's see if we can, um, yeah, document what's currently going on and documenting what's currently going on is a first step around yeah. um, that whole stage. Okay. Yeah. Um, Yeah, okay. 
Would you would you recommend sort of getting everybody? So there's there's seven people kind of actively involved in the organization at the moment. Um, there's kind of a a core team of uh, four people. Yeah, four people. And then there's sort of um, one of them is kind of the, one of those four is kind of a coordinator of another team of four, um, the narrative strategy team. Um, in terms of this early process, because like we kind of have a system of like you, you, you could call it two circles at the moment. Um, in terms of this process of formalizing roles, do you think it'd be worth bringing in everybody um, even though they're not in, in, in this general circle to, to kind of be involved and, and buy into this basically affirming the structure, if that makes sense. Hmm. Um, how closely or not do the two circles work together or does the work overlap or relate to each other? Um, Not horrifically closely. It's, uh, I suppose, the narrative strategy work kind of feeds into, um, like, we're, we're still in a, the general circle is still in a stage of figuring out, okay, what, what does the organisation want to look like? Um, and we're, we're, you know, very much in that early stage where there's lots of little pieces of work and lots of people have different, their hands in different parts of the pie. Um, so it's, yeah, it's all a bit mushed together, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So that's one consideration is the extent to which the work is very, very distinct and there wouldn't be any overlap or the extent to which there might be some overlap and some mm -hmm. connections. And then another consideration in that decision would be how are the, what's the kind of people context like? What's the social relationships like between members mm -hmm. of both of those different circles or groups? Yeah. Um, and any kind of power issues around those. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I suppose, yeah, there's, every, everyone is friends. Um, everyone's friends with one another. Um, but I think that perhaps in the narrative strategy team, there's, um, Maybe there's a discomfort with with power at the moment, and and maybe a, a really strong desire for clarity. So I suppose that is why I'm, I'm I'm leaning towards potentially having them involved as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that's something I'll just need to reflect on. Yeah, I think I can't really give you a, yeah. a direction either way, but what I can highlight are some of the considerations. Yeah, and that's really useful. Another thing to consider might be the amount of time taken as well, because obviously doing it with two groups would be more. Yeah. So how much time would people be willing to invest and how easy might that go? Another consideration yeah. would be if you think one group or circle might be more receptive to the idea than the other, you could start it in that one and use that one as a kind of like champion or advocate of like, let's pilot it here. See yeah. if it works, and if it does, then let's bring it into the other one. Yeah, that's kind of one approach. Or another approach is actually we want to like bring everybody on board with us all at the same time, and yeah. let's invest in bringing them together. In do and there's an additional benefit in doing so because it might mean that there's a potential for a reconfiguration around how mm -hmm. those two circles or groups are currently structured and formulated. Yeah, and it might be that one way this process sometimes goes is you you break down the existing work and people and things into like there's constituent pieces as small as possible mm -hmm. and then you look at how they cluster together naturally and you might end up having a complete reorganization of like oh what this person what this person was doing over here this work actually lives naturally much more naturally together in itself and that looks like this kind of role and then these bits mm. go together from over here and you end up having a new configuration of roles or mm -hmm. constellation of, of work into roles um, mm -hmm. that you maybe weren't thinking of because of the like historical precedent of oh this person's always done this and that's how it should be 
Yeah. So whether you think there might be benefit in kind of opening, like deconstructing and then potentially reconstructing, that's another yeah. consideration. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to write that down. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Okay. There is one other thing that I can say about that whole process as well that might. Yeah. Um, it's about this idea of when you write down what people are currently doing as a way to try and document um, and create some roles, is the issue of what it is you actually are going to turn that into. Yeah. Um, and there's different ways of thinking about it. You know, I guess the a conventional way of thinking about it is well. You know, this is a job description of here's a list of responsibilities, mm. um, and we know that, that this person does these things, um, but they could don't do anything else. You know, they just do these things, and that's because that's their job. Yeah. But then the approach that's taken in more agile self-organizing systems like holacracy, maybe more in sociocracy as well, are uh, what you write down a, a like in holacracy, you write down accountabilities. Mm. And accountabilities have two different sides to them. And I don't know if you've, you know this, on one side of an accountability is, is it's an expectation. Mm -hmm. So it's what other people and other roles can expect of this role holder mm -hmm. when it's written down as an accountability. Mm -hmm. So it, in one, on one side of it, it's conveying an expectation. On the other yeah. side of it, it's conveying authority or power. Mm -hmm. And it means that the person who's in that role with that accountability has the authority to do whatever they see fit to enact that accountability. Mm -hmm. So the power or authority to do those things is, is kind of decentralized and distributed and defined into this role and conveyed by that accountability. So you've got the balancing mm -hmm. out of these two things around power and authority with accountability and expectation because mm -hmm. they're two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And that's part of, is like a constituent building block of the decentralization of power that happens in self-organizing systems. Yeah. Is the documenting of these things and then the understanding of them as having these two things that balance each other out. Right, right. Um, do you have on hand like a good example of um, like a list of accountabilities? Yeah, so well, there's plenty. Um, I don't know the details so much of how it works in sociology. I know a bit about sociology, but I don't know loads. You might know more about that than I do. Um, in sociology, how are the roles, role definitions written? Do you know the structure of that? Yeah, so I believe it's, um, it's aims, domains, and accountabilities. It's quite similar. Mm. Um, but an aim is defined sort of as, a, as the end product that the circle or role um, is working on domains is areas of ownership and then yeah accountabilities is I believe it's kind of defined as ongoing activities or um, yeah things you can expect from people yeah, yeah. so that's to yeah. um, I'm more familiar working with democracy yeah and that's um, I'm just thinking of an example to show you so, find one, hold on a sec. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Yeah. So can you see that right? Uh, yeah, I can. So this is an organization called Evolution at Work. Uh -huh. um, it's an organization that I would previously have been a partner with and I've recently stepped out um, mm -hmm. for various reasons that I won't go into now, but um, you know, we're still on good terms. Mm -hmm. And um, 
this organization uses Holacracy, and this is an example of GlassFrog, which is a software platform that uses Holacracy to document these things like role definitions and circle structures. Yeah. So this is the anchor. I'll just hide this part. So this is the anchor circle. So you go in here. These little circles are roles, and you just look at one of these. Um, so if you click on finance, then it's instead of aims, domains, and accountabilities, it has purpose. Yeah. Like see, these are the, th the three concepts. And so here's the list of accountabilities. And you'll notice each accountability is a, it starts with a, a verb that ends in ing because it's defining an ongoing activity. Yeah. And the idea with what, how you write accountabilities is you're, you're wanting to write them as like concretely and specifically as possible. Yeah. So not vague, not abstract. And the idea is if you were sitting down next to somebody when they were performing this accountability, what would you see them doing? You know, mm -hmm. That's a good rule of thumb to use when you're going to write down an accountability. Right. So you'll see these things, you know, tracking, reporting, and accounting for all financial matters, mm -hmm. invoicing clients when triggered by relevant roles and so on. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of organizations have their governance records available um, publicly in, on GlassRock. Yeah. And if you go to the Holoxy One website, which is holoxy one dot org, mm -hmm. um, there's a part of the website there that has a list of organisations that use Holoxy, and it has links to their Glassdoor records, so you can access it that way. Did, did just me did me showing you that help, or is there more you want to dig into around that? No, yeah, I think I've just got to um, dig into some stuff on Glassfrog and really just kind of look at some different examples and get my head around it. Um, yeah. Cause I think, it, I think the, the thing that's complicating is where we're trying to, we're doing something that's a bit different from both sociocracy and holacracy. Yeah. Um, so like into, in, in place of purpose, we have um, mission, which is sort of a bit more elaborate. Um, but we're, we're hoping that it will provide a bit more direction. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we're also doing sort of objectives as well, like high level objectives, which kind of I think sits somewhere between um somewhere somewhere between like mission and accountabilities is just like what is the high level kind of more abstract thing that you're doing. Um so yeah, I don't know. That's, that's yeah. yeah. Um I was wondering, yeah, just sorry. Last, just one last piece on that. So, you know, that's fine, all of that. You know, a lot of people are mm -hmm. diversifying and creating their own versions of these um, systems. The, the thing that I would advise on is when you're doing that is just to be really clear around your definitions. Yeah. You know, with Holacracy, there is the constitution which defines these terms. And then that is the reference point that people can use around this. So if you're going to start, um, varying those or making them up or not using an, a kind of off-the-shelf self-organizing system and use yeah. your own one then you want to have clear definitions of those things that people yeah. can you know access there's and that there's a process for what happens when there are different interpretations around those terms and also that there's a process for evolving them when needed yeah and ideally those things would be written down yeah as part of whatever governing documents you have. Yeah. I don't know if you're using any of the, the stuff from S3, which is another self-organizing system, but that, there are probably some patterns in S3 that you could bring in around this. Okay, great. Yeah, I need to look into S3. I'm still yet to get into it. Yeah, cool. That's a really, that's a really good point. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was wondering if, uh how much time do we have yeah if um so i know you you helped set up the self-organizing system with extinction rebellion mm -hmm. um i was wondering if you would be up for sort of just sharing a bit about how that experience was um i'm really interested in how how you went with organ with sort of introducing a governance system into a social movement uh, a governance system like i i understand it's similar to holacracy um, how did you go with introducing that in a social movement organization? What were the challenges that emerged? Um, how did people at different levels of the organization gel with, um, gel with that way of working? Mm. Mm. Um, well, there's a lot I could say about that. Um, it's quite a lot of different aspects. 
I think the first thing I'd say is, is what I said at the beginning in terms of how I initially approached introducing it mm. was what I was saying at the beginning around in response to certain kind of tensions. And someone, how it happened is someone got in touch with me. At, it was around about November, 2018 and said, oh, hey, um, XR are doing Holacracy, so you might want to, you know, get in touch with them and see if you can help them. And I read in some of their, so I then had a look and read in some of the documents that they, you know, said, oh, we're using Holacracy and then all of that, whereas clearly they weren't. Mm -hmm. And clearly um, someone had some ideas about Holacracy that were not that accurate about what it was. So I went along and had, had a chat with a few people and got invited to a like a meeting where all the coordinators were. And this this was in so like late November, early December. I ended up going to the meeting in January. This was at a time when when the there had been an, an initial like their initiating structure was a core group of what they call um, coordinators. Mm -hmm. So like the founding members, I think they're about 10 to 13 of them. Mm -hmm. um, that was the initial structure. And that initial structure had like reached the limits of its useful life. It had become too much of a bottleneck. And there was a, some dissatisfaction in the movement around centralization of power. You know, what, why does everything have to go through the coordinating group? And so they disbanded and they were like, um, we don't need this anymore. We're not going to do it. And they did that thing of having some kind of formalized structure that they then disbanded and then created this big vacuum and then it was really unclear of like well we don't know who's doing what and where how the decisions get made you know so then then wasn't really any clear structural process and that was about the point that I came in and I just talked to a lot of people and ended up at this meeting where a lot of these former coordinators had came to and then a lot of other people were there as well and just said look you know, it seems like things are a bit chaotic because your coordinating group has disbanded and there's nothing to replace it with. And here's some things that could help with that. Okay. And I said, you know, one thing is to um, replace that previous structure with another kind of structure, because if you don't, you have um, what I called was, I call it the tyranny of structurelessness. Okay. I don't know if you've heard that term before. But yeah, I have, yeah. Um, so it seemed like, the tyranny of structurelessness was governing a a XR at that time. Mm -hmm. And that uh, people were going like, yeah, yeah, really, you know, this is what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then saying, well, you know, like I work with Holacracy and I, you wouldn't want to use Holacracy in XR because it's not appropriate and suitable for lots of different reasons. But I could take some elements and principles of Holacracy and translate them into this for you and so that's what I did and I just basically made like five points around um, defining roles, um, creating a, a structure, um, using a governance process, you know, things like that which yeah. evolved into the XR SOS constitution, self-organising system constitution for XR UK. But I basically just said, you know, here's five points. Um, and I'd done a bit of work previously with, there was a team called the Mandates team um, so I'd done a bit of work with them around preparing some of this. And then yeah. um, people were like, well, kind of sounds like quite a good idea and it might solve some of these issues and no one else is suggesting anything and we need something. So let's have a go. Um, so one of the key things there was that there was a team that was working on that already. Mm -hmm. and that it wasn't just one person coming in it was like oh there's a team of people who who were into this idea of you know evolving organizations or um working on the organization that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so and it just really grew from there there was a lot of um like backwards and forwards and a lot of negotiation and then a lot of conversations and suggestions around what the initial structure should be that went into glass frog and i was leading on that piece at the time and you know i had like these five different basically whoever i spoke to would give me a different suggestion of well i think it should look like this with this these over here and these over here and this part of this circle yeah. and somebody else would say it like 
completely inside out and then somebody else would slice it up in a completely different way so um that reached a bit of a point where people were saying look we just need to start with something and i was like we just need to start with something so i just like integrated everything i'd heard and said let's start with this and just threw it out and um so that got agreed as let's have this as initial structure that can evolve and then here's the process by which we can change and evolve it so people understood that it wasn't written in stone um, so that was a really key milestone um one key milestone was like introducing the ideas and having a general acceptance of it and let's give it a go yeah. it was a decision point of like okay so from this point on we're going to start working in these ways so that's one milestone and then the next milestone was and here's an initial structure and let's start using this initial structure mm -hmm. and then the next milestone was i wrote the constitution and then within the structure that had started then it was another decision point of from now on we are going to operate by these rules that are in the constitution <laughs> so those are the kind of three major milestones and in terms of how well it's gelled or been you know kind of taken up by different parts of the movement it just really really varies mm -hmm. according to you know people their preferences their personalities their experiences mm -hmm. the kinds of teams you get um so yeah some teams partly because of what the teams did you know so some teams like the actions teams kind of didn't pick up much of it to start off with because they're very action oriented and just want to get on with it and didn't want to do much stuff around structure and process yeah um and then got into their own particular mess around not having any structure and process and so then brought it in because of the messes they got into mm -hmm. other teams kind of did the opposite where they like maybe like uh team teams more around strategy and that kind of thing because they were much more process oriented Mm -hmm. got really deeply into it and then got a bit tangled up by trying to get deeply into it and too much into process and mm -hmm. um, um so got a bit tangled up in that way so different teams worked with it in different ways and different people the one of the so i'll go back to the important thing was having a, a team of people working on this and it wasn't just one person that everyone can project onto oh it's nick and he's just trying to dominate everyone by bringing in this system that he thinks is yeah. going to work. you know there were multiple people working on it and then because of that and i was bringing in some expertise around how it worked that i could kind of skill up and train up the team in some ways and then they could then go out and start decentralizing some of that those skills and knowledge mm-hmm does that begin to answer what you were asking? Yes, yes, it, it really does. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there that I didn't know. Um, could I ask what, um, like I suppose you said there was a lot, but what were the points that, that jump out at you around why um, you thought holacracy didn't, uh, wouldn't work in XR? Well, Holacracy is a self-organizing system specifically designed for organizations mm -hmm. that have a very clear boundary around who's in the organization and who isn't in the organization. Mm -hmm. And then because it's for organizations that have that clear boundary, those organizations then within that boundary have quite a clear, um, will have clear processes or will have at least a mandate or a rationale for using clear processes around when you're in this organization this is how things work yeah and when when you're not you know you're doing something else but xr simply as a social movement you know like local regional global national social national global social movements doesn't have such a clear boundary mm -hmm. and also within that boundary because it's a volunteer organization doesn't have the kind of leverage that a lot most other organizations have in terms of when people get paid and then need to stick to certain kinds of rules. So the social context is also very different. Great. Cool. That's yeah. That affirms a lot of suspicion. I guess um, just, yeah, I had assumed that was, I guess, yeah. Cause I've been trying to grapple with, mm. you know, what, what can an organizational system look like on a social movement level, which is something we'll need to grapple with, but that's a challenge for another day. Um, just on that point, there is a yeah. guy called Yuri. I don't know if you've come across Yuri in um, XR. He's part of the global um, 
group that's working around the self-organizing system and he's doing some really interesting work around i think he's might be calling it you know sos 2.0 or something that's around taking what we've done with xr uk on a national level uh -huh. and then translating some of that into how would this work in a decentralized global network of different national xr initiatives mm. that is open source in this kind of network where using some of the kind of open source software models that can be iterated on and um, used in that way at a larger scale mm -hmm. so that you might get in touch with him i think you can get in touch with him through xr uk that, yeah that'd be grand um what's XR his name? last name are you able to share yes let me see if i can find it um Or Corvalan, so C O R V A L A N, Yuri Corvalan. Great. Amazing. Thanks for that. Yeah. Cool. Um, last question. Uh, this, this, this one is one Layla one that wanted to go into. Um, she was curious about tribe space and. Um, what processes and activities you found useful within tribe space? Hmm. I'm pausing because the answer to that question depend again, like another question you asked, it depends a lot on what else is currently happening in the organization mm. and what would be a good fit. Mm -hmm. um, was your let me just check with you your understanding of tribe space as in the question that you're asking that might help me give an answer to tailor it um i think if i remember correctly it's kind of the inter it's basically the interpersonal relationships um outside of the outside of work mm. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 And that's a common way of putting it. Um, well, there are so many and it, it depends on, so it depends on what's going on, but also depends on what kind of functions you want to um, do in, in, you know, what you want to be done there. So some, there might be some stuff around feedback is often quite an important one about people yeah. giving and receiving feedback to each other as people okay. um, that can support the interpersonal relationships. Um, that is outside of roles, you know, it, or it happens across multiple roles in multiple circles. So that's to do with the people and how they're relating to each other. Okay. Um, and there's different kind of approaches to doing that feedback is a key one another key one is just really people getting to know each other mm -hmm. so just organizing and i don't know how much much of that you do you know but making sure that the only stuff that you do together isn't just always only work yeah and that there are things that you do together that nurture your interpersonal relationships as well you know some for yeah. some people that's like you know going bowling or you know, whatever <laughs> you know making sure that you do some of those like social bonding kind of things yeah um, there are some around um, communication, helping people communicate yeah. um, well. There's a lot around working with difference, um, which might be differences of opinion. Um, it might be differences of perspective. It might be cultural or other kind of um, socially constructed differences. Okay. So there's a lot. And the best collection of practices you know, so you have like lots of individual ones that are just dotted all over the place. You know, there's a hundred, loads of different ones like that. And then you get collections of them, mm. um, like Matrix Leadership mm. is one, you know. And, and for me, that's why I was putting on a course in Matrix Leadership, because for me, that's the best um, collection of practices that I've found for this kind of work to support people in a, a tribe space or in the people context, as mm. distinct, distinct from the organization context. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
if you want me to carry on talking, I can go into a little bit more depth about what yeah, I think, think that is. So I'm going to share my screen again because there's a list. Um, I think the list is, so this in-person training here. So this is the matrix training that we were going to put on. Yeah. And this, so on this list, these are the, some of the things that are covered. And these are the things in the matrix leadership model. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to make that a bit bigger. And these, I think these are a great set of practices for okay. tribe space, for people context stuff. So establishing a matrix of person to person communication. So there's a practice in that, which is about when you're in a group, um, having ways of talking to each other where you're talking just to one other person within a group. Yeah. I don't know if you come across that. Yeah. yeah. So that's a really good one as part of building um, this matrix of relationships where everybody's having relationships. So that's one. Mm. Um, another practice is, is this idea of ground of health that you do lots of activities where you're getting to know each other, you're showing appreciation and gratitude. Um, and again, there's a lot of different practices, like specific practices to help with that. So then okay. there's giving and receiving feedback, whole set of skills around that. Um, there's a whole piece of work around um, roles. Mm. And this isn't looking at formal roles in terms of what roles even in the organization, this is looking at informal social roles that people take on. Right. Maybe in a group, someone takes on the role of the clown, making people laugh, and someone else will be the outsider, and someone else will be the witness, and someone else will be the peacemaker. Yeah. There's these kind of archetypal roles that always get taken up by people in a group. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to look at which roles do we naturally take on, and um, how well or not is that serving our group. Mm -hmm. And then once you can do that, you can look at distributing those roles mm -hmm. amongst the group. Um, yeah. So do you want me to carry on talking about the rest of these or you, do you want to, you can just look at it on the... Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to look at it. Um, that's great. Is, um, is there like a repository? Because I know Holacracy kind of re refers to tribe space apps. Do they have like a central repository of, of practices and stuff as well? There are, there's a Holacracy community of practice. Yeah. Which is open and free to join. And on that, there's a, a collection of like crowdsourced tribe space apps that okay. people have, you know, shared and said, this is what we've done. And these are our, our apps. So there's a, a list there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in a awesome. role in Holacracy One. I'm, I'm leaving Holacracy One soon, but I'm in a role where I'm um, also curating and um, tabulating and kind of documenting and, and sharing a lot of that work as well. So I'm happy okay. before I leave. Cool. Um, quick one before we finish. So on matrix leadership, um, I did, I did the preview webinar a few days ago. Um, they, so I'm guessing it's a situation where kind of the more people you, you get trained in it, the better positioned you'll be. Do you think like getting a few people say if, you know, if four out of, our current seven were to get trained in it, if that would be sufficient to kind of really embed this stuff, or would you say it's like critical for everybody to, to do it if they could? I think as a general principle with matrix leadership, the more the better. Mm. But I think if an, a really good basis would be more than half. Yeah. So I'd say with, with four out of seven, I think you, you're on a solid you've got a good solid start there. Okay. What you don't good. want is just one person doing it and then coming back because it's really, really hard. Mm. Two is definitely is more than twice as good as one, but then yeah. more than half is, is pretty ideal. Okay. Brilliant. If you can't do it with everyone, you know, sometimes Amina comes and does it with, you know, just all in one organization and, you know, it's really tailored and, and then is a really powerful set of techniques of transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, great. That's that's all, all the questions I had. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. I'll stop the recording here then. Sounds good.